I'm Sameet Garg, a pediatric spine surgeon and associate professor of orthopedics at the University of Colorado. In this video, we're going to talk about a modern classification of spondylolisthesis. Our objectives in this talk are to discuss the two primary types of classifications for this condition. These are etiologic classifications and radiographic classifications. The radiographic ones are related to the amount of slip in our more simple classifications and a more complex classification that looks at global sagittal parameters as described by the Spinal Deformity Study Group. So for some background, spondylolisthesis is forward slippage of one vertebra on another. In pediatrics and adolescents, we primarily see this at L5-S1 as opposed to in adults with degenerative spondylolisthesis where it's more common at L4 and L5. In the pediatric population, this is primarily due to dysplastic posterior elements at L5 or a stress fracture at L5. The Wiltsey classification is the most common etiologic classification utilized for spondylolisthesis. The dysplastic type is where there is an elongated and more horizontally oriented posterior elements at L5, as seen on this x-ray. The ismic type, which is probably the most common in adolescents, is seen on the image on the right, where there is a stress fracture and gap of the L5 pars bilaterally. Less common types are degenerative, traumatic, and pathologic, which are primarily seen in adults. The Meyerding classification is the simplest radiographic classification. This is based upon the amount of slippage of L5 on S1, with grades 1 and 2 being less than 50% slippage, and grades 3 and 4 being greater than 50% slippage. We typically consider grade 1 and 2 as low-grade slips, and grade 3 and 4 as high-grade slips. Over the last decade, there has been greater attention paid to the global sagittal parameters of the spine and the sacrum and pelvis. The pelvic incidence is a fixed measure of the sacral pelvis and is drawn as a perpendicular to the end plate of the S1 and a line drawn from that point to the center of the femoral heads. It's a summation of the sacral slope and pelvic tilt and is not felt to change throughout life, and it is unique to each patient. The sacral slope is an angle drawn from a horizontal and a line adjacent to the end plate of S1, and the pelvic tilt is an angle drawn from a vertical to a line drawn from the center of the sacrum to the center of the femoral heads. When you add these two angles together, you get the pelvic incidence. So the modern classification of spondylolisthesis incorporates these global sagittal parameters. Types one through three are low-grade slips and differentiated based on the degree of pelvic incidence, with type one being a low pelvic incidence, less than 45 degrees, type two being a normal pelvic incidence, 45 to 60 degrees, and type 3 being high pelvic incidence, or greater than 60 degrees. Types 4, 5, and 6 are high-grade spondylolisthesis, based on the Meyerding classification, and these all have high pelvic incidence, but varying degrees of sacropelvic and spinopelvic balance, which we will review. So here we see types 1, 2, and 3, which are all low-grade slips by the Meyerding classification, just with increased degrees of pelvic incidence. Types 4, 5, and 6 are seen here, which we will study a little more deeply. So the type 4 slip is going to be a high-grade slip, so that's greater than 50% slippage of L5 on S1 with a high pelvic incidence. These patients maintain sacro-pelvic balance and will have a high sacral slope and a low pelvic tilt. What differentiates a type 5 from a type 4 is the sacro-pelvic balance. In a type 5, the sacrum and pelvis are unbalanced, and this is seen with a low sacral slope and a high pelvic tilt. In a type 6 patient, there is also a low sacral slope and a high pelvic tilt, and this represents sacro-pelvic imbalance, but these patients are also globally out of balance, as seen with the C7 plumb line falling well anterior to the sacrum. In contrast, in the type 5, the C7 plumb line falls through the center of the sacrum. So really the controversies currently lie in how to best treat the type 4, type 5 spondylolisthesis. We know that low-grade spondylolisthesis, types 1 to 3, rarely need surgery. And we also know that someone who is globally out of balance is not going to do well unless that sagittal balance is restored. So that's the type 6 patient who needs to have their C7 plumb line brought back to be better balanced globally. 
The question is what to do about the type 4 and type 5 slips. There have been some studies showing a higher quality of life postoperatively if you can balance the sacral pelvis, but we also know when doing a reduction in high-grade spondylolisthesis, the complication profile will increase. And it is also difficult to know what are the best surgical strategies to restore sacral pelvic balance. So these are the questions we are wrestling with currently to see who benefits from a reduction and also the best technical ways to achieve this safely. Surgical treatment can consist of anterior only surgery as seen in the left image, posterior only surgery as seen in the central image, or combined approaches as seen in the far right image. What is best for each unique patient is still to be determined and is gonna be based on a discussion of the pros and cons between the surgeon and the patient. If you have a patient with spondylolisthesis or another complex spinal condition, please feel free to refer them to the spine program at Children's Hospital Colorado. For more information, you can reach out by any of these contact methods.